do a quick changeover here. Uh, I'm supposed to do a formal introduction of the next speaker, and I'm going to do the formal introduction at some point here, but I'm going to do the informal introduction. Uh, when I agreed to MC today to be your host, I didn't realize I was going to get to introduce one of the people that I'm in awe of and have been in awe of for most of my career. You're going to have a real treat. Uh, Terry Ellis, which I'm going to get into the formal introduction, but Terry Ellis was uh, the founder of Chrysalis Records. Chrysalis Records was the home of Procol Harum and Jethro Tull and Robin Trower and a lot of other amazing acts. Back in a time where people like Terry and Chris Blackwell from Island and Phil Walden from Capricorn discovered talent, nurtured talent, recorded talent, uh, I think they were the home of the uh, 360 deal long before anybody knew what the 360 deal was because back in the day you managed the artist, you booked the artist, you recorded the artist, you toured the artist. So I think if we're ready, and I'm getting the cue. So it is my pleasure, and it really is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the stage Terry Ellis. As the founder of Chrysalis Records and responsible for guiding the career of many legends, too, too numerous to mention, Terry's going to share with us his own vision of the history of rock and roll and give us his thoughts on the present state and its future in his keynote discussion. Now, he's not going to come out right away. We're going to start with a film. So when I say, please welcome to the stage Terry Ellis, he's not going to be here. So I'm not screwing up this time. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the stage at Music Matters, Terry Ellis. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, well, I have to put the, the, the PowerPoint up. I don't like them. You don't like no. them? No. I mean, I thought I'd come in here. What's your attitude towards me? No, I have no attitude towards you at all. Why should I have an attitude towards you? I don't even know you. No, but I mean, it would be an attitude if you wanted to know me or didn't want to know me. Why should I want to know you? I don't know. And that's what I'm asking. Well, I don't know, eh? <laughs> Ask me another question. <laughs> Just give me a reason why I should want to know you. Um... I might be worth knowing. Why? Huh? Why? Tell me why. What good is it going to be for me to know you? Tell me. Give me, give me one thing I want to gain. Well, you might learn something from my attitude to life. Well, what is your attitude to life? Huh? I can't explain that in two minutes. Well, who are you asking me to explain in <laughs> huh? two minutes? That's how you're getting in two minutes. You're asking me to explain something in two minutes, too. Well, you're the artist. You're supposed to be able to explain it in two minutes. I am? Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> what about you? Aren't you an artist? Oh, no. What are you? Uh, what? What are you? I'm a science student. Well, let's hear it again. What are you? A uh, what student? A science student. Now, what does that mean? Now, just what is that I am the science student. Good afternoon. How's everybody? You enjoying yourselves? Enjoying? I really enjoyed Cesare and Toulouse. Weren't they fantastic? Really, it's nice to hear some beautiful voices. It's a great conference. Enjoying Singapore? I mean, enjoying the conference? Jasper and his team put together a really great conference. It's quite an achievement to put so many influential people together at one time in one place, and it's incredibly helpful for everybody. What you've just seen was uh, an extract from Bob Dylan's UK tour in 1965. Now, I was a student at the time, and I was desperate to see Bob Dylan play, but as I say, I was a student, so I, I couldn't afford a ticket, so I talked my way backstage on the pretext of coming to interview Bob Dylan for my college newspaper. Now, interviewing Bob Dylan was the very last thing I wanted to do because he had a terrible reputation for dealing with journalists. He hated journalists, particularly UK journalists with, with some justification. So he just announced he wasn't going to do any, he was so fed up with UK journalists, he, he announced he wasn't going to do any more interviews on that tour. So when I asked to do an interview, I was very secure in the fact that I wasn't going to get one. I just wanted to see the show. But he called my bluff. I was conducted into the dressing room, and, and you saw what happened to me. Now, 
This whole tour was filmed, including my interview, and was released a couple of years later as a full-length movie called Don't Look Back. And you could be forgiven for asking, how did the idiot talking to Bob Dylan in Don't Look Back manage to get a successful career in the music business? And I think it's a very fair question, and I'll try and answer it. I'm an English boy. I was brought up in a small town just north of London called Welling Garden City. I went to university in Newcastle upon Tyne in the north of England. And when I got to Newcastle, I discovered beer, I discovered girls, and I studied those two things really, really hard for my first year at college. Um, beginning of my second year, I decided that I really ought to shape up, take advantage of the great opportunity that I'd been given. So I went to the president of the Students' Union in Newcastle. This is the Students' Union building in Newcastle, pretty much the same today as it was back in the early 60s. And I asked him to give me a job. You know, I said, you know, maybe I could organize the debating society or maybe reorganize the catering facilities in the Students' Union. I just wanted to get the full college experience. So he said, well, we actually don't need anybody to do those jobs, but we've got, we do have a job we need filling. The students seem to want these pop groups at college, and I don't know how to do that. Do you know how to do that? And I said, well, no, I have no idea either. I'm a fan, but I have no idea about the music, the uh, professional side of things. But I asked for a job, you've given me a job, and I'll do my best. So I, they gave me a small ballroom in the Students' Union, and my job was to book a pop group in there every Saturday night. So I did some research, and I found that there was a very popular local group called the Alan Price Rhythm and Blues Combo. So I found their manager, and I booked them for my first two Saturday nights in charge. And they were fantastic. They were a really good blues band. They played all night. I think we played them, paid them 25 pounds. It was a big success. We sold out. But then they ran out on me. They left Newcastle, went to London, recorded a song called House of the Rising Sun, and changed their name to The Animals. So my first two weeks in charge, I had The Animals playing for me. Not a bad start. But they ran out on me, they went to London, so then I went to, uh, had to go to Birmingham, I went to Birmingham, I, I hired a band called Jimmy Powell and the Five Dimensions, another great blues band. Jimmy had a really good band, very unusual. He had a harmonica player in the band. The guy second from the left with the funny haircut was the harmonica player, and the harmonica player's name was Rod Stewart. And he went on to be quite successful. So then I had to go to London. I went to London, hired a band called the Graham Bond Organization. Graham is the one in front. He had a, a drummer called Ginger Baker, the one on the left. He had a bass player called Jack Bruce on the right. They later joined up with a guitarist called Eric Clapton and formed a group called Cream. That's Jack in the front. Unfortunately, a few months ago, Jack died. So you can see that in that brief year that I was in charge, I was able to meet some pretty impressive musicians. And so by the time I graduated, I'd fallen in love with the music business. In particular, I just was in awe of the amazing musicians that I'd been able to meet, and I just wanted to be part of their lives. So when I graduated, I decided I wanted to start a booking agency. So I teamed up with a guy called Michael Jeffrey, who was a local club owner, and I suggested to him that we form an agency together. Now, he was also he was the manager of the animals. He'd also just signed a, a new management client, a young American guitarist called Jimi Hendrix. And he'd opened an office in London, so he was doing very well. I moved into his office and started a booking agency with him. Now, I wasn't booking the Animals or, or Jimi Hendrix. I was booking some of the smaller bands that Mike managed. And after a year, I really wasn't doing very well. I'd come face to face with the realization that in the tough competitive business, like the English music business was at the time, that youthful enthusiasm just wasn't enough. And that's really all I had. I didn't have any contact, I didn't have any power, I didn't have any leverage, and I wasn't able to do a very good job. And I wasn't getting enough work for my bands, I wasn't making any money, and I had to give it up. 
and I had to go and find a job. And I was absolutely devastated because I'd found something that I really loved, something that I thought I was good at, and I'd failed. I was embarrassed, I was humiliated, I wanted to just run away. But I dusted myself off and I went and got a job. I went and got a job as a systems analyst in a computer company. But I decided I'd start something part-time to see if I could work my way back into the business. So I started a part-time booking agency, booking bands into colleges. So on my evenings and weekends, I'd go to colleges and persuade them to let me do organize their entertainment for them. And after a year, I found I was making enough money to give up the day job. Now, giving up the day job in the computer business was a big decision because I was making good money in the computer business and I could see I had a really strong financial future there and I liked the work. I just didn't love it. <laughs> and I loved the music business, but there wasn't any money in it. I mean, there wasn't any money in the music business in the early 60s. But I made a decision that I wanted to spend my life doing something I loved, so I turned my back on money and just go for the love. So I gave up my day job in the computer company and went full time in my booking agency, specializing in booking bands into colleges. I found I had a competitor, a guy called Chris Wright. We met, we decided to merge our businesses together and he moved to London and we formed a company called Chrysalis. From his first name, Chris, and my second name, Ellis. And we were a booking agency booking bands into colleges. And, all of our, and we were immediately successful. We were booking bands into colleges all over the country. And all of a sudden, we found that we had something that I didn't have when I was with Mike Jeffrey. We had power. Because we were booking so many colleges, controlling the bookings of so many colleges in the UK, giving so much work to bands, the bands started to come to us and ask us to represent them. So we started to build up a roster of small blues bands, <laughs> many of whom became big blues bands. And then we had a breakthrough. We had a tiny office in the middle of London. And all of a sudden, one day, the door burst open. And this huge guy walked in, big, wide like this, tall, fat, big beard. Hello, boys. I'm Peter Grant. I manage Jeff Beck. Now, Jeff Beck was already a rock god. He'd been the guitarist with the Yardbirds. The first guitarist with the Yardbirds was Eric Clapton. And when Eric left, Jeff Beck joined, and then Jeff Beck left, and he formed his own group. And we got a lot of work for Jeff in our colleges. And Peter Grant had noticed this, and he said to us, well, I've got Jeff represented by Harold Davison, who's the biggest agent in England. He's, he's Frank Sinatra's agent, but he's doing nothing from Jeff for Jeff. All Jeff's work is coming from you. So I'm going to take Jeff away from Harold Davison and give him to you to represent. Well, I, we were gobsmacked. We were a couple of kids just out of college, and all of a sudden a famous manager walked through the door and presented us with a rock god. Well, we got on with the job, and we did a very good job for Jeff. Mind, Jeff had a very good band. This is Jeff in front. On the left is his drummer, Ainsley Dunbar. On the right is his bass player, a guy called Ron Wood, who's now been with the Rolling Stones for 25 years. And at the back, his singer, it's that man again, Rod Stewart. So Jeff had a very good band. And we did a fantastic job for Jeff. And a little while later, Peter came back in the office and said, you guys doing a great job for Jeff. I've got a new band for you, a new band I want you to represent. So Peter explained that he also managed the Yardbirds. And the Yardbirds had decided to retire. But the, there was a young guitarist in the Yardbirds who didn't want to retire, who wanted to carry on touring. So he was going to put a completely new band together and call it the New Yardbirds. And the Yardbirds agent wasn't interested in the New Yardbirds. It sounded a bit hokey to him. So Peter brought the New Yardbirds to us to represent what we were pretty excited. Peter was a big manager, and New Yardbirds sounded fine to us, so we started arranging dates for the New Yardbirds as their new agent. We never seen the New Yardbirds play, so we didn't know that they sounded like this.
So Peter had taken the New Yardbirds' first album to Atlantic Records in New York, and they said, well, this is the best thing we've ever heard, but you've got to change that name. So they changed their name from the New Yardbirds to Led Zeppelin. So all of a sudden, these two kids just out of college with a funky little booking agency, we become the booking agents for the band that was about to become the biggest rock and roll band in the world. It's pretty heady stuff for a couple of kids. But we went on, we continued to build our booking agency and eventually built it into something you know, quite significant. We were representing a bit of a who's who of the up and coming bands at the time. We, as well as Led Zeppelin, we were represented Yes and Roxy Music and King Crimson, Supertramp and a whole bunch of others. But our hearts were really in management and we started to manage some of the bands that we represented. My partner, Chris, was managing 10 years after, and I was managing Jethro Tull. And these bands entrusted us with the responsibility of helping them to make a living out of playing music. And really, this was the limit of their ambitions, as it was in a lot of the bands in the 60s. There wasn't any money in music in those days. And so the, the, all the bands wanted was really to be able to give up a day job and make a living as musicians. But in our case, we had greater ambitions for Jethro Tull and 10 years after. We thought they had great potential, so we decided we needed to build their careers. And one of the first things we needed to do was to get them a record deal. Now, why do we want to get them a record deal? To make money? No. Couldn't make money selling records in the 60s. No, what we needed the record deal for was marketing. These were great live bands earning a living playing in clubs, and we needed the world to hear more about them. So if we got a record deal, the record company would get the record on the radio, we'd get us newspaper and magazine coverage, and it was, was an effective marketing operation for our live performing bands. So the record was a marketing tool, the record company was a marketing company. So we were able to make a deal with Decca Records for 10 years after. Decca were one of the biggest record companies in England. We were thrilled. We thought they knew all the things that we didn't know, and we were wrong. They didn't. This was a time of change in the British music industry. We were going from a period of prepackaged pop to where the musicality of the artist was more important, where the lyrics of the songs was more important, and where the stage performance of the artist was more important. And Decca didn't understand that. And when the 10 years after record was released, it was a fiasco. Now, we recovered from that, but when it came to making a record deal for Jethro Tull, we weren't gonna make the same mistake again. So, we were aware that there were new independent record companies emerging around the world. There was a and in the US, and there was Island in the UK, so we decided, well, we couldn't do a worse job for Jethro Tull ourselves than Decca had done for 10 years after. So we thought, well, we'll give it a try. We'll start our own record company. So we started Chrysalis Records. And I took Jethro Tull in the studio. I'd never been in a recording studio before. We made an album, cost us 500 pounds, which, we, which I had to borrow because we didn't have any money. And we released the first album of Jethro Tull and the Chrysalis label. Went top 10 the first week, and all of a sudden, we were in the record business. Now, I hasten to add that being in the record business wasn't a, a, a long-time goal of ours. It wasn't part of a plan to be in the record business. To being in the record business for us allowed us to control the marketing for the artists that we managed. So our first foray was successful, so we recorded some of the art, other artists that we managed and had some success. But as I say, we were essentially a management company. The record label was a part of the management company. And we built a group of companies to handle the affairs of the artists we managed to allow us to keep control on their behalf. So we had our agency, our management company. We also managed Procol Harum and Robin Trower and, uh, and Supertramp. We had our music publishing company. We were also David Bowie's publisher. We handled all our own concerts. We promoted all Led Zeppelin's concerts. And we, we managed a, a, a rock venue in London called the Rainbow Theatre. 
But we soon realized that in order to fulfill our obligations to the artists that we managed, we needed to grow our record company. In particular, we really needed to open up our own company in the United States. So in 1972, I moved from London to Los Angeles, and we made a distribution deal for the Chrysalis record label with Warner Brothers Records. Here we are with the Warner Brother team. This is, in, in the bottom right-hand corner is the legendary Mo Austin, who was the chairman of, of, uh, of Warner's at the time, who Ted Cohen knew very well. He worked for Mo. Above Mo, the, the bearded wonder is my partner, Chris Wright, and the incredibly good-looking guy at the front with all the hair. Yeah. <laughs> in 1976, our deal with Warner Brothers ran out, and I decided to take the company completely independent. So I hired my own marketing and promotion team. We set up our own distribution for our records in the United States and became entire, totally independent. That allowed me the freedom to sign some of the interesting American bands that I came across. So I signed Blondie, I signed Billy Idol, I signed Pat Benatar, I signed Huey Lewis and the News, and we had a lot of success with those artists. And at the same time, my partner was having success in England with artists like Spandau Ballet, Ultravox, Leo Sayer. And by 1985, Chrysalis Records had become one of the most successful and powerful independently owned record companies in the world. But that's, that's a little bit about me. But those are the old days. And now people say to me, you know, Terry, with your experience, what is your view on the music business of today? Because it all seems to have changed. It seems to have changed out of all recognition. With the internet, with digital downloads, declining record sales, music business seems to be in trouble. And I say to them, no, 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 no. You've got all that wrong. The music business isn't in trouble. The music business hasn't changed. The music business hasn't changed for thousands of years. The music business is about musicians getting on a stage and entertaining people. The record business may have changed. The record business may be in trouble. But those two businesses are quite separate. Now, at some point in the 70s, the executives of the major record companies decided that they were so important that the words record industry and music business were interchangeable, which they're not. They're two completely different businesses. The music business is the business of musicians. Musicians make music. Record company executives sell records. They're different businesses. And to really understand the distinction, you have to look at the history. The record music business is thousands of years old. The first musical instruments that archaeologists have discovered have been dated at 40,000 years old. These are whistles from prehistoric California. This is a, a flute made from the bone from a wing of a bird that was found in Germany and dated at 35,000 years old. So the likelihood is that musicians have been entertaining people for tens of thousands of years. We can certainly go back a couple of thousand years to the Roman Empire days, and we know that musicians were entertaining at feasts and weddings and important occasions and were greatly appreciated and were highly remunerated. And also in the the Roman, the, the Egyptian empire. So the music business is thousands of years old. On the other hand, the record business is a very new business. The phonogram was only invented 130 years ago. The first record came along 100 years ago. And the modern record industry may be 60 years old. So they're different businesses. One's very old, one's very new. How did these two businesses come together. Well, to understand that, you need to go back to the 30s and the 40s. And at that time, the pop groups of the day were dance bands. The star musicians of the day were band leaders, people like Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller. 
And if you wanted to see Glenn Miller play, if you were in, in Baltimore, you went to the Hippodrome Ballroom, where he was playing for dancing. And these were touring bands. They were touring the country, playing in ballrooms all over the country, and they were successful. And at a certain point, the record companies decided that they would record some of these bands and sell the records to fans. And this was very good news for the bands, because for, in Glenn Miller's case, if he was in Baltimore playing at the Hippodrome Ballroom, he might not be back for another three months or something like that, and he might be concerned that his fans would forget about him in that time. But if the day after the show they could go out and buy a record and take it home and play it at home, it wasn't a substitute for the real thing, but at least it would keep the memory of him and his music fresh in their minds until the next time he came into town. So this was an important deal. It, the record was a, a promotional item for Glenn Miller and for those bands. Then the record companies found that if they got the records played on radio, they could sell more records. And the bands found that if the music got played on the radio, more people came to the gigs. <clears throat> and that was really important to them because that's where they made their money. The more people that came to the gigs, the more money they made. So this record deal was really important. And it didn't matter that they didn't get paid royalties, they got paid for the recording date, but they didn't get royalties. There were no royalties in the early days. But the bands didn't care because to them, it was a marketing exercise. The record was a marketing tool. The record company was a marketing company. Now, if you skip forward a little, a couple of decades, I mean, as record sales began to increase, the record company started paying modest royalties. But if you move forward a couple of decades to the era of the pop groups, bands like the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, the Yardbirds with Eric Clapton, these were touring bands playing in clubs and doing very well. But they wanted record deals too, and they wanted it for the same reason. Not to make money, you couldn't make money selling records in the 60s. They wanted it for the marketing. They wanted, because they wanted the record company to get their record on the radio, get coverage in newspapers and magazines, and spread the word and build their live performing career. So that was important to them. Then something very odd happened. The golden era of music of the 60s and 70s gave way to an astonishing increase in the sales of records. So between 1985 in the year 2000, record sales tripled. I mean, that's staggering when you think about it. Tripled in 15 years. Now, what did this mean? Well, <laughs> it meant that the record business was a really good business to be in because they were selling a ton of records and making a lot of money. And so it was good news for the record companies. It was good news for the performing artists as well because in addition to making money from their gigs, they were now getting a nice, the successful artists were getting a nice royalty check every six months. Also, it created a new profession, the recording artist. Now, what's a recording artist? A recording artist is somebody who makes so much money from record royalties, merchandising, and endorsements that he never needs to put foot on a stage. In fact, he doesn't need to have any performing ability at all. But then something even stranger happened. As fast as those record sales had gone up, they came down again. So between 2000 and 2010, record sales halved. And by now, 2015, we're back down to 1985 levels. Now, how did this happen? Well, it was caused by new technology. Now, there's nothing new about new technology. We've been adapting to new technology, I mean, since the wheel was invented. The record industry itself was created by a piece of new technology, so adapting to the internet shouldn't be very hard for us. It's necessary in every business, in every walk of life, to adapt to new technology. New technology brings along new opportunities for growth and new profits. As long as you recognize that you need to adapt your business model to the new environment. Now, 
A great example of somebody who didn't adapt his business model was Kodak. Kodak were one of the pioneers of photo imaging and established a huge company on the, based on the business model of selling photofilm. So at one point, Kodak had 90% of the market for photofilm in the United States, a huge business. Then digital technology came along, which they had a role in developing in the photo imaging world. And, but as sales of photofilm started to go down, Kodak was so complacent they sort of sat on their hands and waited for this sort of novelty to go away. And by the time they realized the novelty wasn't going away, it was too late. And a couple of years ago, Kodak went bankrupt. Amazing. Their competitor, Fujifilm, who had the same dominant position in Japan that they'd had, they spotted the writing on the wall much earlier. And they changed their business model to one that wasn't so dependent on selling photo film, but was selling other photo imaging products that they had developed. And today, Fujifilm is a thriving, successful business. And we have a new environment in the record industry, don't we? In the music business. The internet has brought along all these new ways of hearing music, all these internet radio stations, they call with streaming companies. So people are listening to music. All the evidence is they're listening to music more than they ever were. They're more interested in music than they ever were. In fact, the statistics tell us that as record sales have declined, the revenue from ticket sales has gone up. So what the public is telling us is we're just as interested in music as we ever were. In fact, probably more so We've just decided that we'd rather spend the money in our budget for music on tickets rather than records. Now, what does this mean? Well, this is not great news for the record companies <laughs> because their sales have disappeared. It's not as great a business to be in as it used to be. It's not great news for the recording artists either because all of their income has just suddenly disappeared. And they better learn to perform pretty quickly because if they don't learn to perform, they don't have a, have a career. It's good news for the performing artist because although his record royalties aren't quite what they used to be, his core business of performing is as strong and stronger than it's ever been. And it's good news for the new artist too, as long as the new artist can get his head around the new environment of the music industry today. And in particular, he has to get a bit of a perspective on where the record company fits into the music business today and where it fits into his career path. Now, in the period of gigantic record sales, the record companies made a ton of money. And they were quite happy to invest a ton of money back into their businesses by making expensive deals with new artists. So they were quite happy to give, make deals with artists where the artist got a lot of money to make a record, a lot of money to make a video, a lot of money to go on tour, and the record company spent a lot of money promoting and marketing their records. And these deals were understandably very attractive to an artist to be able to get all that money spent on him. Unfortunately, we went from a period, the artist went from a period where getting a record deal with a major company was a kind of a cool thing to have because you got all that money spent on you, to where they began to think that getting that big record deal was essential. It was necessary. They began to think they couldn't compete in the marketplace without that big record deal. Now, what this did, it put the record companies in a position of tremendous power. And in fact, we began to almost see a master-servant relationship develop between the record companies and the artists, which is incredibly unhealthy in a creative business. Unhealthy for the artists, and unhealthy for the record companies. But that's all changed. Those record deals are not available any longer. So 
the record, the, the artists have got to become a bit more self-sufficient. Now, if you're a young artist in your late teens, early 20s, you were born into an era of huge record sales, huge record royalties for artists. So it's understandable that you might have a business model that calls for you to make half of your money from performing and half of your money from record royalties. Well, of course, that's all over. So the artist has got to write a new business model, a new business model where 100% of the income is coming from performing. Because if he becomes a big star, then he might get some interesting record royalties. But for new and emerging artists, and even moderately successful artists, the record royalty income is negligible. So all of his income and all of his future depends on him being a successful performing artist. Now, to me, this is really good news. Because what it means is that the artist is now focusing his attention, not on getting a record deal, but on becoming a great performer. And even more important than that, he's gaining control of his career because he can now see that his future career depends solely on his efforts, on, on his talent in becoming a successful performer, rather than depending on the efforts and talent of, say, a guy in a record company. Now, this has got to be a good thing. But too many artists have begun to think about the music business as a place where you get lucky, get a lucky break, and then become rich and famous. Instead of focusing on the joy of making music and the thrill of getting on a stage and performing. And, you know, the reality is that the Music business is incredibly competitive. There are thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of young musicians all wanting and competing for those few spots at the top. And very few artists, realistically, are going to be successful. But if an artist has a unique and extraordinary talent, he has a chance of success. If he's prepared to put every effort effort and every minute of every hour of every day into becoming a better singer, a better musician, a better songwriter, a better performer, then he has a chance of success. And if he gets some success, he may have a chance of getting rich and famous. But if he can become as rich and famous, it'll be because of his talent and his hard work, not because he got a lucky break. And, but Becoming a great artist is only half of the, half of the story because for a, a professional musician, music is a business. And there are a lot of business factors that play into the possibilities of an artist becoming successful. But he doesn't have time to run his business because he needs 100% of his time to work on his art in order to be competitive. So who's going to run his business? Well, that's where the manager comes in. And the manager becomes an incredibly important person in an artist's career and can make the difference between success and failure. And in the US and the UK, we see the artist becoming more, the manager <laughs> becoming more and more important. Now, you know, it's, it's a great thing for a you know, a promising young Singaporean act like Gentle Bones to get a deal with a big, powerful, international record company like Universal. But it's important for the artists who don't have that good fortune to realize that it isn't the end of the line. It isn't the end of the world that they haven't got signed up by, by Universal. Now, and what we find in the US and the UK is that managers are saying to their artists, do you know something? You don't actually need a record deal because the music business has changed. Prior to the digital era, if a young artist wanted his music to be heard, he had to get on the radio. And access to the radio was controlled by record companies through their legions of promotion men with their relationships with radio stations. If an artist wanted someone to buy his music, he had to have a record in a record store. 
And again, access to the record stores was controlled by the record companies through their distribution units. So basically, if a new artist wanted his music to be heard and bought, he had to have a deal with a record company because they controlled the marketplace. But that's all changed. Any artist can make his music available to be heard. He can upload it to his own website, he can upload it to YouTube, he can upload it to any of the streaming services, and people can go and listen to it. If he wants people to be able to buy his music, easy. You just upload it to iTunes, they'll sell it for you. So the barriers to entry to the market have lowered. And Record company and managers are now saying to artists, you know, you actually don't need that record deal with the major. You have options. There are alternative things that you can do. You can make a deal with a little indie. A lot of successful artists have come. Adele, Arcade Fire, for example, have come out of deals with, have very great success with deals with independence. You actually don't even need a record company. A manager can organize for you to put your own records out and maybe hire some independent promotion people to, to do the promotion and marketing. An artist has options, and the manager is responsible for organizing those options for him. So what we see now, particularly in the US and the UK, is the rise of the manager. The manager is becoming much more important than he ever was. And in fact, I, I, to me, the future, in the future of the music business, the power mongers, if you want to call them that, of the music business are going, not going to be the record companies any longer, it's going to be the managers. And what that does, it creates a very exciting business opportunity for young music executives, young music entrepreneurs, to go into management and become the new power mongers of the music industry. And that same opportunity exists in the Asian market. Young music, young music executives out there have that, have that option. Now you don't have the same tradition of personal artist managers in the Asia region as we do in the US and the UK. But you can change that. And in doing so, you can change your music business. And I can't see, personally, how the music business in any country can develop satisfactorily unless artists have the freedom to create and develop their creativity. And it's the managers that can enable them to do that. Not just by handling the, their business, but by strategizing their careers by developing long-term plans for them over many years and supporting them, encouraging them, and enabling them and guaranteeing them the freedom to develop creatively. And that to me is very exciting because that kind of environment is one in which we can expect the quality of music to develop and grow and increase, which it really hasn't done over the last 30 years. So I'm incredibly optimistic about the music business of the future. I'm very optimistic about a business where artists are focused on music <laughs> rather than business. I'm optimistic about a business where the artists have control of their careers once again. And to the Young people in the audience, whether you're artists or, or young executives who've decided they wanted to make a living and make their career in the music business, I want to tell you, you made the right decision. It's a great business to be in. It's given me a great life. It's still giving me a great life. I have new projects that I'm working on. I'm developing a stage musical with Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull. I'm writing a book about the music business, and I've started talking about the music business, and I love talking about the music business, as you can tell. I really enjoyed speaking to you today, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity.